We're ready. <laughs> okay, should I go sit somewhere privately? Okay. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hello. Working? Not working. Not working. I'm still here. You can hear me. No, uh, no, no, we have to have you. Oh, we have to have this. Video. Okay. Hello. Someone can hear me. Heard. It's all right. Okay. So, all right. It's all right. So it works, but the thing is, our equipment is broken down. So. Uh oh. It's all right. If you're watching this on the archive and you just see my lips moving, I'm saying very important things that are all on the final exam. Uh, all right. Uh, on, on behalf of myself and my co-host, uh, Professor Eli Yablonovich, uh, welcome to the colloquium talk. Thanks for coming. Uh, a couple announcements. Uh, as you know, uh, we'll be having uh, the Turing series, the Berkeley ACM Turing Laureate series, and that starts on the 26th of September and goes to, I think, November 14th. So have that on your calendar. You're going to want to see that and hear stories and uh, insights into the innovations that these award-winning uh, scientists have uh, performed and their interactions at Berkeley. Next week, we have uh, Ranveer Chandra, which is uh, going to talk about applications of artificial intelligence to agriculture. He's a principal researcher at Microsoft Research, so uh, please stay tuned and make sure you check that out. After that, we'll have our very own Professor Bob Full, who will be talking about bio-inspired design and some insights into his research and teaching methodologies. So with that, I want, I want to take away from our speaker today, because as you see, there's demos. Very cool, right? Um, so Mary Lou Jepson, uh, I am really excited to introduce her. She embodies this spirit of engineer, artist, and innovator. Um, she actually, her background, she was originally, her degree was in studio art from Brown and, uh, in, and also electrical engineering. She went to the MIT, to MIT uh, the media lab. She got her master's in holography. That's pretty cool. I would like to do that. That sounds like a great thing. Uh, she also, during that time, developed sort of one of the first computer-generated holography s video systems, and we'll probably hear a little bit about that. She went back to Brown to receive her PhD in optical sciences, where she worked on some liquid crystal displays that worked without polarized light. A lot of interesting ways to play with light. In fact, during that time as a student, she may not mention this, but she also had, a, I think, a pretty good art project, which was to use light and reflected properties from the sun using mirrors, particularly arranged, to actually do a project called Moon TV, where you could actually project images onto the moon. And I think, I don't know if the UN got involved or something, but there was maybe some legislation because, you know, I think a lot of uh, people want to think about projecting and using the moon as a surface. But I like that she thinks very broadly about the application space. Uh, she has always combined her interest in engineering, art, and math, and science. And I think you'll see that in the work she's going to show today. She's worked on head-mounted displays. You probably interact with a lot of different technologies that she's been a part of. Um, you probably will want to take notes using one of your one laptops, which wow. she was also a, a lead CTO on, along with uh, her collaborator at the time, Nicholas Negroponte, and a huge team. So maybe we'll hear something about how she entered that space. She's also had uh, leadership roles at Google X, at uh, Intel. She was an executive uh, at Facebook Oculus VR. She held a faculty position at the MIT Media Lab. So an amazing career. and There's a lot of insights to gain from that. And uh, she's also the Anuta Borg uh, Foundation named her one of the top 50 female computer scientists of all time. And she's going to also talk to us about her latest uh, sort of venture, which is a startup uh, where she founded Open Water working on fMRI technologies for imaging the body. And I think that may be part of the demo because I see body-esque material <laughs> up here. Um, but join me in welcoming Mary Lou Jepson. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, can everybody hear me? I have a mic on. Awesome. It's so great to be here, and what a great introduction. <laughs> I'm so surprised that people... So, yeah, I want to talk to you. I, I love talking to students and trying to figure out 
how to get you all to take bigger risks and do more even if you fail and fall flat on your face on doing it. I founded four startups. I've also worked as an executive. I've been um, on the faculty of a couple different universities as a professor and uh, um, I worked, you know, I, I did my degrees at, at Brown and, and, and at the Media Lab but then also a lot of art schools because for me it's the same thing because I do optics and a lot of stuff with the human visual system and, and uh, I, um, as an undergrad doing electrical engineering, I thought it would have squished any ounce of creativity I might have had, and I'm not saying I had a lot, but you know, I joined a punk rock band and started doing art. And then, you know, I really enjoyed the electrical engineering, but I needed to do both just to um, keep my sanity. So this brings me to a quote from my dear friend Neil Stevenson, who's a, 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 a very famous science fiction writer. and. Uh, said he saw the best minds of his generation um, writing spam filters and actually <laughs> in a dinner that night at, I was at the conference when he said it we revised it too I saw the best minds of my generation optimizing click-through revenue for ad sales so <laughs> that's good it made everybody a lot of money but you know like actually if you go into that now it might not be that interesting for you and so I'm just trying to hope I'll talk to you a little bit about some crazy stuff I tried, failed sometimes, and succeeded sometimes. But um, maybe the key thing is just telling everybody you're going to do it and go for it. And then you get kind of the crazy people of the world to be at a path to your door. And you get to be on the fun project. And you get to work with smart people. And you figure something out. And if the goal is worthy enough, if you get 1% of the way there, if you get 10% of the way there, it can be transformative for humanity. And also, if you go for something like that, you don't have to get good at management because it's mission-based work and people just, they work harder if they can do a project that can have a really big impact on humanity. And so one of those projects, um, it was mentioned in the introduction, I co-founded One Laptop Per Child. I was at Intel. I was the CTO of a division at Intel, which I convinced them to close because uh, all of Intel's manufacturing processes, it's great being with an EE crowd, all of their manufacturing processes at that time were um, rail to rail, either zero or high. And we were designed, I was the CTO of the display division, and liquid crystals changed their optical properties as a function of voltage. And so everybody that could change the voltage could make better chips than we could. And I explained that to the CEO and they closed the division. They said, could we do low cost laptops? And they first said, don't call it a laptop. And so anyway, um, <laughs> because there was apparently at that time this issue with people's thighs being burned because laptops were really big. A lot of people probably don't remember at the time. Laptops cost $2,000 plus the software, another $2,000. And so we were saying, I, I went to MIT as I left Intel to become a professor and decided to give up on commercial industry for the rest of my life. I know, I'm back here. <laughs> I've been at Google and Facebook since, but that was my decision at the time. And it took about three weeks to co-found One Laptop Per Child with uh, Nicholas Negroponte and we had the titans of industry. My former boss, you know, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Michael Dell, all saying it was utterly impossible, it would never work, both publicly and privately deriding us and two years later we shipped it, had two billion dollars of revenue, became the fastest collectively with um, our for-profit partners, the fastest growing consumer electronic category ever recorded and transform the lives of 100 million children. So it went from crazy impossible to all of these people beating a path to our door, everybody helping, maybe companies that were Microsoft and Intel were the Facebook and Google of their day. I know this is only a decade ago, but they were, um, not that they're not powerful now, but they were even more powerful. And um, yeah, I mean, you can do it. That's the thing. And it's, it's, it's just amazing. Like. I would just uh, just wake up at, like I'd go to sleep, and then I'd wake up at two in the morning and just say, you know, the kids need to have their laptops, and everybody on the project worked like that. People would stay up just not one night in the row, but two or three to try to do their part of the project. I literally went around the world, I think every month for, for three, four years to get this to happen, working with a bunch of people that we were able to bring together to make this a reality. So I'm just saying you can, you can do that. And Moon TV, I thought of, like this was another project that a lot of people thought were cra was crazy. I was doing this, I was um, in graduate school and 
I was doing my um, PhD in, in optical physics, but I kept looking up at the moon every night because I had traveled so many places um, and lived in so many places. I, I, I was lonely and I would look up at the moon and like my friends in Australia or Japan or Germany or wherever I'd been living were looking up at the same moon and I thought, huh, could you do it? Could you project on the moon? And I figured out how by using this solar energy facility in the Mojave Desert and redirecting the sunlight incident on like this square mile of heliostatic mirrors that track the sun that's usually just focus on Nevada water and boil the water to make steam to drive electricity and putting a million dollars of optics on that was enough light to get on the moon. But then I had all these death threats is really what the issue was <laughs> from Islam where there's religious significance to the crescent moon. I didn't know. I mean just because you can do it, should you, is a certainly important question because there were ethical implications, not just for that religion, but also societies that were pre-technological and, and what could happen to them. So decided not to do it, but did all the technology, did the test stuff. But, and, and sometimes it's like that. And so we really do have to think of the ethical implications of what, what we're doing. Um, I quit my job. Uh, a little over two years ago, I had a pretty cushy job running advanced consumer electronics at uh, Facebook and Oculus, uh, designing uh, really the roadmap for next generation virtual reality and augmented reality. Because I had this observation that the manufacturing process improvements being put in place to make next generation high fidelity VR and AR could have. I think more profound impact in being able to see inside of our bodies and brains and, read and potentially read and write them. And I've been wanting to do this for a long time. I'll um, admit something kind of personal. Um, when I was doing my PhD in that Moon TV thing, and yeah, so I, think I had a brain tumor, and I was really sick. I actually dropped out, went home to die. Somebody sprung for the MRI. They found the brain tumor. I was the only person happy about this because we had a diagnosis. I no longer had to die. I could have had a surgery. So I've had non-elective brain surgery and become, became unwittingly um, interested in neuroscience and, and brain science as a means of self-preservation since 1995. So um, yeah, I just thought every brain cell in consumer electronics was focused on next generation virtual reality and augmented reality, which is cool and something I've worked on a long time, but nobody was seeing how to apply the manufacturing processes that were being put in place to um, switch the wavelength up to see if we could revisit FNIRs and near-infrared imaging to, to be able to see in high resolution in our bodies. So, um, I see, I think Jack Gallant's in the back, right? So I'm a big fan of Jack. So I, I also read this paper he wrote, um, I don't know, 2011 or so. I think I have a video of it in the presentation. But I was also really excited by your work. Um, in what you were doing with fMRI. So not only like do we have this fact that two-thirds of humanity lacks access to medical imaging, these things are big and bulky, a two-ton magnet, but also Jack back there saying, boy, we can communicate with thought. I don't know if you know his work. I'll show one of your videos, but maybe you can come up and I'd feel dumb um, in comparison. But we're trying to make him better tools. Like, can we get away from the $16,000 fMRI scan so that we can see what's happening in our brains at, at higher resolution is the question. Because if I throw you in one for an hour, I can tell you if you've got a tumor or, a, or a, a, bio, a condition. And if I throw you in it for 10, 100, 1,000 hours, you can start to, as Jack has shown and others, imagine what words you're about to say, what images are in your head, your dreams, and so forth. So. We're trying to put the functionality of that into a consumer electronics wearable that can be in the form of a hat or a bandage or a wand. And we've gotten pretty far along to do that. And as I mentioned, it's pretty important because so much of humanity lacks access to medical imaging. But that's even us. That was even me as a graduate student as an, at an Ivy League school in 1995. And if we could do more scans without the contrast agent or radiation, we could say, is it getting bigger? Is it getting smaller? Is it staying the same size? These things are pretty important for diagnosis and for therapy to see, is the therapy working? Is the therapy not working? And so forth. If you could do it um, 
without you know the power plant, the two ton magnet, the radiation, and so forth, we could we could have a profound effect on a whole bunch of of medicine. So as I mentioned, um, here's an example of um, you know work that uses um, convolutional neural nets of back propagation to infer you know grainy images of dreams using fMRI, for example. And so as I started working on 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 this, we just wanted to know how. For the f it's, this company is a little over two years old now, but we really wanted to know, using this technology I'm about to explain to you, how deep we could go and at what resolution. And what we found was, at this point, about a year in, six inches deep at five microns resolution, which is the diameter of the smallest neuron. So that means we can use light, non-invasively, even through the skull, and focus down to as fine as a few microns. I've had a lot, a lot of people tell me, ah, that's totally irrelevant, you can't use that for anything. Um, and then I was just talking to a professor here who's, who's working um, on that, and her name escapes me. Can you tell me? Ricky her? Muller. Yeah, Ricky Muller. Yeah, I was like, whoa, let's do it. So, and you can also um, use that light to write the state of neurons, which is pretty interesting, and it becomes a speed issue and an and a engineering issue on you know, what system you create. We're not actually focused right now on doing this. We're focused more on one or two millimeter resolution for our first products. We have the capability to do it. We've, we've focused on doing this in a different way. So what is it? Um, so I, I brought this, this light. Um, our body, if I turn down the lights, ooh, I have spotlights. Yeah, so. Yeah, if it's possible to get these. I brought a big light to show you. Your butt, your, you know, red light really does go through your hand. You know this if you were like a kid outside, dark, with a flashlight, and you took it, cupped your hand around it. Um, the light would go straight through. So x-rays go through your body, gamma rays go through your body, huge magnetic fields go through your body, but lowly red light and near-infrared light also go through your body, and that's, you know, it's a lot cheaper per photon <laughs> than, than um, you know, gamma rays. And so the question is, like, can you use this to see something? And I have some, um, I implanted, I've got some, uh, I have pork loin today because it was on sale <laughs> at the Safeway near where I work over in San Francisco. My startup's in San Francisco, oh, so pretty close. Um, and um, so I implanted a tumor in, oh, maybe the other one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, there it is. Okay, so I implanted a tumor that has the same optical properties as a tumor. And pork, pig has pretty much the same optical properties as human flesh. A lot of times they use chicken, but pork's actually better. So you can see, using just red light, you can see tumors. But there's a trick. I implanted the tumor close to the top of the pork, which is why, if you've already seen, I have the second piece of pork loin. And when I put that on top, <laughs> you can no longer see the tumor because the light scatters. Well, red light and near-infrared light go through our body, they scatter. And everybody thinks scattering is random, but there's the hint. It's not, it's deterministic, it's reversible. There's a lot of things that you can do. And what we've been exploring at Open Water is how you can use these changes um, in the consumer electronics pipeline of basically small pixel size because with small pixel size you can record both the amplitude of the light and the phase of the light. You can record holographic interference patterns and that ends up being the trick in, in descattering the light. And so for example, here's a hologram. Um, as was mentioned, I, I'd spent the first 10 years of my career in holography um, making all kinds of display holograms and holographic video systems and so forth. But this, a hologram records all of the light from every angle rec and reconstructs the entire wavefront. Even if that object was a scattering dense mass, we can record a hologram through it, as has been known for 50 years. 
the guys that first made holography a reality, Dennis Gabor came up with the idea 70 years ago after the invention of the laser, I think here, right? Um, these guys started to create, sorry, I just made my step goal today. I don't know how that's <laughs> <laughs> possible. Uh, so these guys um, basically that made this hologram, a very whole, uh, at Uris, uh, Leith and Eupatniaks in uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, made this very hologram, very famous hologram of a train set. And then the next experiment they did, they took a ground glass, a sandblasted sheet of glass, and made the same hologram and they could make the train appear through the ground glass. Because it's not just amplitude, you're recording phase, you're recording the entire wavefront, which means you can use holography to see through scattering medium. But how? So here's an example of uh, these marbles are sort of like, imagine they're photons, and this is like the scattering of the body. Really in your body, the light scatters every tenth of a millimeter, there's approximately a scattering event. And so you see as they get to the bottom of this maze, they're going in every direction chaotically. But if we recorded a hologram at the bottom and side of this maze, we could then bring the marbles from below through the hologram that would direct the marble to exactly the right angle and position so that it could emerge as a straight line of marbles. So this really works. Um, I did this um, uh, live on stage at TED in April, which was a challenge with the spotlights. But here you see a piece of brain, this is a piece of brain, optically identical, that scatters the light. I'm using green light there so you can see it, but just made a brain with a hologram in front of it, right there, lace. This is like the m old marble experiment I just showed you, but with billions, with trillions of photons, using holography to get a super fine focus. and, and this means we can see through brain and tissue. And you're probably thinking, you know, brain really? Like how are you going to see through skull? Well, I have real human skull here. You can order it online. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Skullsunlimited.com. Um, and so you'll see, let me see, this is a better laser. Um, the light goes right through the skull too. Um, this is white, so you optics people will know, like white scatters, black absorbs, and so we just have to de-scatter the light through the skull, but the absorption is only about 5%. Our bodies pretty much scatter light, they don't absorb much of it in the red, and especially in the near infrared. I'm showing it to you in red light, because we can see red light, <laughs> and I wanted you to see it. So, um, so yeah, that skull. And then, you know, we, I, I mentioned we focused down with, that, with that, a similar setup live on stage to a few microns through inches of, of uh, optically identical skull and brain. Now, one thing I want to say is this isn't living brain, living brain moves. And so we're going to talk about that in a second. Right now we deal, I've shown you dead things, not living things first. So we started with dead things because we made time it's almost like when you take statics and dynamics, you say F equals zero for a whole semester, then F equals MA, so this is the F equals zero. It's fun being in an engineering school. You guys all did that too? We did that. Okay. So this is uh, uh, our, our lab prototype sort of last winter. It's pretty big, you'll notice. We scan things here. This is a camera system. We had an ultrasonic probe on an XYZ stage. I'm going to explain how we use that in a second. A laser, a rack of equipment. Um, it's pretty big, but using that, we were able to uh, find, find tumors we implanted in, in things that had the optical, were optically identical to human flesh, even things with vasculature, and got about 0 0.5 millimeter resolution. We said, well, this stuff works. We could do so much better if we made our own chips. And so we've designed our own camera chips, our own ultrasonic chips, our own lasers to allow us to radically improve that performance and use it in living animals. And so right now, the system that we're building out right now uses an ultrasonic array, an optical camera chip and uh, optical fiber to the mouse. We just got a small animal facility and we're starting testing on live animals because we were able to, much like when you use, a con this is a continuous wave source or laser, this laser doesn't um, pulse, it just stays steady. 
what you want is the equivalent of a strobe light or like if you're in the disco floor and you dance and you, go, you can only see your arms at certain things. The speed um, that we have to do that at is actually a really slow pulse because what we care about is how the speckle of your, of your body changes in time. It's funny, uh, some people that have published in this area, I was talking at Photonics West this year, which is a big optics conference in January in San Francisco, to this Dutch professor who was saying like they had 45 minutes to uh, see through the speckle of the body. And like our studies show you have 50 microseconds and that's a really big discrepancy. So I talked to him after the thing over a beer and he's like, well, he went to uh, the doctor in the Netherlands, we have national health care there. He said, how long can I put a tourniquet on a graduate student's arm? <laughs> no joke. And the answer was two hours. So he came back to the lab and he said, nobody goes longer than 45 minutes with a tourniquet. And so if you slow down the blood, that's the really the thing moving in the extremities. But if you do that on your head, like that's called strangulation and you die. So <laughs> we're like, no, we're going to make the pulse laser. So we made the pulse laser and we're measuring rats right now. And so the thing that we're um, working for for next year is our alpha kit where we have arrays of our systems of camera chips and ultrasonic chips and then the laser fed through um, a fiber optic system for distribution. So we're working on, on this right now um, and really uh, fine tuning the um, specs for that. And I still haven't explained, you're probably thinking, okay, I get our body being translucent to red light, I get holography descattering, but how do you scan it out? And so the answer is imagine these um, three black disks represent the subcomponents in, in this last system. And we send an ultra, what we do is we use sound. We use a sound approach, we literally use sound. We use an ultrasonic ping that focuses down to a spot. And, and sound, the reason we start the ultrasonic ping earlier is because sound is slower than light. And so we make them end up at the same place at the same time. We shine the light in. As you know, the red light just goes everywhere. It scatters, it's just haphazard. But the light that goes through that ultrasonic focus changes color slightly, it Doppler shift. It changes just like the pitch of a police car siren changes as it speeds past you. So it changes color slightly. So we use a property of holography that's well known. Has anyone ever made a hologram before in the room? Yeah, a lot of, actually a lot of people. So traditionally you can only make a hologram with two beams from the same laser because nothing else is coherent enough. But what you can do is just make a hologram, if we frequency shift the reference beam to our hologram by the same amount, which we can do with an acousto-optic modulator, then the only thing that's going to interfere on this camera chip that's part of that black disk is the orange light. And I represent the orange light, it's not really orange, it only shifts a, a very little bit. And so we get this ripple. That ripple is the information from that spot. And so then we decode that on chip. Like, what's really cool, two and a half years ago, I thought that a lot of things were going to go into next generation smartphones. And we sit here now, and I spend a lot of time in Asia, so I know what's going into the next iPhone and some other things, and I shouldn't say here. But um, 3D sensing is super hot with stacked chips that have 70% quantum efficiency and micron pixels in the near infrared with on chip, so the second, the, the stack chip, the second chip is for image processing, real-time image processing. Now, we don't really care about the shape for shading or the, the um, structured light illumination that's being used where, where there's, you know, a, an, an array of about 450 uh, pixels of vertical cavity emitting lasers light is um, being put into next generation smartphones to allow you to get um, facial recognition. You know, I can take a smartphone and go like, and then it'll know if the clothes that I want to buy at the store fit me or not. I don't have to, try, you know, like things like that to, or, or like Pokemon Go plus plus as you interact with your world with AR meets smartphones. So that's happening. But we can use those same camera chips, although the logic layer we want to put under um, allow, allows us to really optimize with the discrete Fourier transfer and processing to decode that hologram to understand what's happening at this point. And then with an LCD we've created, we can optionally 
focus the light back down to deliver photodynamic therapy and then uh, just move to the next spot. And spot by spot, we can scan out the brain and the speed that we can go to, we're looking at 100,000 um, voxels a second with this system. It's possible to multiplex it. Um, we might start slower. There's, there's, a, there's like where you can get to and what we go for first product. I have a startup, so we have to focus on the first product. But we decode that interference pattern much, much like Rosalind Franklin decoded this iconic image of x-ray diffraction to reveal the structure of DNA for the first time. But we can do that at a million frames per second. It's a 2D Fourier transform. It's just not that hard. It's really great, again, being in the ECS department where everyone knows what a Fourier transform is. It's pretty well-established territory. So um, what we, the signal that we're working on right now that we think is a really great signal to start with is blood, and I brought some blood, although I lost my flask of it. I've got some in a <laughs> thing. Yeah, you can buy this at Amazon. Um, okay, I admit, it's fake blood, it's not real blood. But you see this absorbs. I mean, it's really interesting because red obviously reflects light, but compared to the flesh, where this is my pound of flesh, I mean, that really scatters a lot. And so we can see the difference in the SNR of the scattering versus the absorption of blood. We can also see the color change that blood makes, whether it's carrying oxygen or not. They cross over at about 800 nanometers, but oxygenated blood peaks in absorption at about 720 nanometers, and deoxygenated blood peaks at about 820 nanometers. I mean, it goes further, but you have to look at the absorption of water by your body and, and so forth. And so this is, this, this is the infrared kind of window to your, to your body. So a bit more about the camera architecture is, um, is here where I mentioned a two chip, but one micron pixels, one microsecond frame time is easy. Like, actually, any of your camera chips, like Doc Edgerton, if anyone remembers him, he invented the flash strobe back in the 40s, maybe it was the 30s, where maybe people remember the iconic picture of the bullet through the apple or the milk drop. Those are microsecond flashes. He also worked a lot with Jacques Cousteau, did a lot of effort in the war. Microsecond pulses to, to, freeze, to freeze time. That's all, that's all we need. And that works right now with your camera if you use an existing flash. The problem is the output, not the input. It's pulling all of that frame off if it's like a 10 megapixel thing really fast at 100,000 frames per second, which is why these stacked chip designs are so popular. There's even a lot of, uh, both Sony and Samsung have triple, step, tri triple stack architecture so that you can do the on-chip decoding of the image so you don't have to pull it off at that same frame rate for things that you're doing in sensing. All, is, all of it's going mainstream into products that ship at a million units a day next year. So this is awesome. We get to draft on that. So on the laser, I mentioned um, you know conventional lasers, uh, we used a lot of continuous wave, equivalent of F equals zero or just freezing time. We uh, have a 300 millijoule laser that uh, we've made. We've also got some smaller, like uh, 10 millijoule lasers with the coherence that we need. Because one of the things is the coherence of that laser has to be really great because that ultrasonic pulse, the, the bandwidth of the laser and its coherence has to be smaller than the shift that you make by the ultrasonic ping such that you can only see the interference of that. So we've made um, a bunch of different lasers and we're working with others and now we have two Nobel Prize or winners in laser physics on our advisory or helping us with them and advising us. So that's going pretty well. We're working with a number of companies on that. And then, yeah. yeah, so the ultrasonic chip. The other cool thing is that's happened is there are all these companies now using MEMS processes <coughs> to make ultrasonic chips rather than the traditional method which is taking a piezo material and a saw and cutting by hand layers and filling them with like a rubber material so you separate them. Because if you separate them and do phase delay, you can steer the focus any way you want to with this type of thing. But that's now um, mainstream processes at TSMC and others. There's two major, one's called CMUT, one's called PMUT. Um, there's less fabs with PMUT. Most of them have CMUT capacitive this is what the C stands for. But um, 
that allows us to scan. There's a few companies going to ultrasonic systems that plug into phones right now, smartphones. Butterfly Networks is one uh, near Yale. There's some few others. And we just piggyback on that too, which is super cool. So um, on specs, uh, a lot of people ask scan speed. We, have, we don't know what we're going to do for our first product right now. We might, um, we can go up to 100,000 voxels per second. We don't know if we will. How deep we can go is basically related. The limits of the system are the safety of how much light we can put in, which is a function of surface area. So if you think of an obese person, I'm just pointing out they have more surface area. area. The limit is about 20 millijoules per centimeter squared times the depth, times the si the, then the size of the focus, and then the surface area of the chips to collect the light. And so what we're creating is this modular system that, you know, we get asked sometimes, could you do a horse? Like a guess, but then we need a big laser. And then like if we do like breast cancer, a small laser, and maybe some of the medium laser. And so what we're working on is a tethered approach where I think I showed you back um, this image of, of this alpha kit that we're making where there's tiled uh, components of our camera chip and ultrasonic and a distribution of the fiber laser. The fiber laser right now is sitting off board for certain applications if you don't need a lot of depth in the skull or like I think it'd be cool to make the BRCA bra if a woman gets like the BRCA gene she doesn't have to have surgery like you could just check or you know there's a lot of different applications like this where you know if we can go on and on. So um, how deep can you go? And signal to noise ratio. And on signal to noise ratio, we keep getting an order of magnitude better every three or four months right now. And so we're really pushing that out with, it's almost like peeling an onion. And so we're going to show, I think, at a conference in November, our live animal scan. So I think that's when we're going to say numbers around them, just to put a, put a thing in there. So yeah, so what we're trying to do is change the way we read and write our bodies and brains. We're really starting with reading because there are really profound ethical implications with writing. Although, to be fair, we are using focused ultrasound and that can also activate. We're actually at the level where we can deliver therapy. We're working with the Focused Ultrasound Foundation on that. That's sort of a group that collects as many as they can of people working in focused ultrasound because we don't know that much about it. But at about one megapascal, that's about the therapy. It's just we do that for a microsecond for a therapeutic to ablate tissue or, or um, treat various things, deliver deep brain stimulation, et cetera. You use about a megapascal, but for 15 seconds. So we can do it. Um, so again, the uses really are for, for most of humanity. But you know, we know that MRI gives better resolution than mammography for imaging breast cancer, but we don't use it in the U.S. For, for, for screening. And in fact, no country in the world uses it for routine screening um, because it's too expensive. <laughs> so if we could lower the cost of it, and if we could see inside of our body, we could detect issues that we have earlier and we could see the differentials because a lot of it is is the thing changing. A lot. We all have cancer all the time and we're able to kill it apparently and when it gets to stage two, stage three is really um, when you want to deal with it. Uh, profound applications for brain disease which is the most expensive disease in the world. Using fMRI scans you can determine what type of depression the person has. You can see if the therapy is being effective from a biological standpoint rather than DSM which says literally you answer these questions of are you tired? Are you sleeping more? Have you gained weight? Do you have thoughts of suicide? And if you answer yes to those you're depressed. That's literally the definition. Rather than looking at the brain activity and saying whoa this is an indicator of depression. If they take this drug, does the brain activity, like you could see it, like you could see what was happening in your brain. It could be pretty amazing. Um, this is a, one of my favorite clips. I threw it in there and did not know Jack would be here, but hoping. Um, and I, I, he can explain it, but uh, I'm just going to do my bad explanation of you gave up, I think, you worked with rats and then macaques and then you began using graduate students as lab rats and they laid inside of MRI machines for hundreds of hours watching YouTube videos while the, while, the cam while the computer recorded the reactions to image sequences and then a new image sequence was shown 
And so using deep learning, backpropagation, the tools of our time, the computer then inferred a pretty greedy image of what this new image sequence that the graduate students were watching, which is pretty amazing. So I saw this and I'm like, whoa, it's time to help. Like, can we like make this, can we up the resolution? Can we lower the cost? Like, because it would be pretty amazing to be able to, you know, transcend language and communicate I mean, what would we be capable of? And, you know, you know, like, there's no octopus that's ever going to get into Cal, right? Like, this one's never going to get to go to school. Like, we're not the only thing with brains. It's kind of crazy, but we might all become vegetarians. Um, so, <laughs> really, if we start seeing what they think. So, um, as crazy as this all sounds, it uses the, the tools of our time, you know, big data, machine learning, and consumer electronics, which is really what my background is in and trying to contribute how I can to that. And actually, people just gave me a ton of money to get to the next step because they want to run the experiment. And so we're um, Alpha Kits next year. We're really excited. So I, we have a little bit of time left. I can answer questions or we could do whatever you want to in the time. Okay, great. That was a, a lot to uh, experience, and so I think there's going to be definitely some questions um, from the audience. Um, yeah, we'll start right here. So it seems like the method is to transfer the resolution from the ultrasound over to the optical. Uh, so that's great. But w what if I had just used the ultrasound alone? Uh, would I get useful? What additional stuff do I get by uh, introducing the optical? Um, you can use ultrasound. It's hard to get that kind of image. You can't image blood. And then also we live in a world where CMOS images are a bucket piece and at the micron size. So we can, we, it's just, and you can't detect single photon, but the second photon you can detect. And that's in every smartphone. So the noise floor is so low, you can make a deep, deep well size. So it's just, it's really easy. The easy part of ultrasound is focusing it down. The hard part is the, the, the basically the decoding what's happening. And they're grainy images. They're getting better. I'm all for ultrasound. I think it's super cool. But looking at what you can do with sensing the light out has some advantages leveraging these improvements that have been made, particularly in the near infrared. Continuing on on the ultrasound thing, uh, first of all, what frequency of ultrasound are you using? And then uh, you've talked a lot about how uh, you can figure out sort of this reverse scattering matrix for the optical realm, but the ultrasound itself will also scatter through skull and tissue. Um, right. How do you deal with that and also uh, coupling to the skin and things like that? Right, so the gel right now, we can go dry. Um, the speed of sound is different in skull than flesh and so with multiple points we can correct for the aberrations of that because not every skull is uniform and in fact if you want to look at we've got a piece of skull here it's phrenology was a real thing <laughs> it's, it's bumpy um, and so it depends where where you the study of bumps for personality in the late 19th century <laughs> people believed it um, yeah so um, why so sorry I, I lost the, the second part of the question uh, so just the ultrasound scattering through the skull. Um, right. Okay. So that's yeah. with the multiple points on, mm -hmm. on the skulls. So we correct for that, and um, and attenuation. Oh, on what frequency? So we use anywhere from one to twenty megahertz. At twenty megahertz, you only get a couple centimeters of penetration, but you can focus to hundred microns. At about five megahertz, five to seven is a sweet spot where you get a, a millimeter, two millimeter focus and you can scan around and so that's higher resolution than fMRI and pretty easy to make a laser with the coherence but but basically it's software reconfigurable because you're using MEMS processes so you can change the resonant frequency to what you want so you can do coarse scanning and then fine scanning if there's a region of interest via software. Are there known physical correlates with depression that could be imaged, or is that something that would have to be developed once devices like yours exist? There are nature papers. I met with um, a couple of professors over the last week, one at Stanford, one at MIT, um, who are working in this area. But it's, it's not, 
I was talking to somebody who said, you know, I talked to all these different people, and it's very interesting when you talk to the medical profession. Like, I'm talking to somebody from the school who is in the breast imaging department, and it's like, well, we just image the whole body, but then you have to talk about, so I was talking to psychiatry, and yeah, there's papers, I can share them, that show different patterns for whether you've got um, anhedonia, which is the opposite of hedonism, so no joy, um, or you know, um, really uh, anxiety and, and different. And there's and really very high correlations, like 0.9 across, I want to say 1,200 different patients at multi hospitals. So pretty rigorous stuff published over the last several years, and more of that coming that I've had in private conversations with those professors, but. Right now, a psychiatrist doesn't have a buildable test. Mm -hmm. It's DSM. So that maybe is an interesting place to go. Maybe it takes too long. Uh, there's just so many examples of, you know, we could do like, what kind of stroke did you have? Did you have a clot type stroke or a hemorrhage type stroke? Because right now, if you live within two hours of a CT scan, you don't have to suffer as much, per dramatically less permanent damage than people that don't get a CT scan to determine what kind of stroke it was so that, that you can give the right medication because if you get that wrong, the patient dies. So you have to do the scan and then you can, but there's a ton of different uses for lowering the cost of something by a thousand X and the size by a billion. And so we're trying to figure out what to go for first. Hi, I was just wondering, I, it was unclear, you showed many different technologies to me or during the talk and I was not clear what you guys were trying to target for your first product or first application. Okay. Is it everything? Tumors? Neurons? <laughs> I mean, what, we what is... We haven't announced yet. Okay. We have some ideas. Uh, but um, it's funny. Like, I, I spent a lot of time in Sand Hill Road last summer, and they kept asking me what the go-to-market plan, what the killer app was. And, the, and I started with saying, you know, it's a bit like we're creating this platform, the cell phone, and you wanted to do one thing. I'm like, okay, call mom. <laughs> Nobody laughed. You're going to be the first people that have ever laughed because like, they're like, yes, that's exactly what we want. And you're like, okay. Because <laughs> like, from their perspective, they're investing a lot of money in your startup and they want to make sure it's not a bottomless pit. So what's the first app? Like, you know, and so a really good answer for that is something that doesn't need FDA, doesn't have reimbursement through insurance and is an existing market. So an example of that, which we're not necessarily doing, we're not committing to do that, but an example of that, which is not, I, it's not that I don't like pets and veterinary, it, that fits that, where people spend five to seven thousand dollars if their dog or cat is sick, they actually spend more on their dogs than their cats. Um, <laughs> they do, I guess we like our dogs better, statistically. <laughs> or the owners of dogs spend more money on that, or whatever it is. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to say that. I'm not saying people don't like their cats, they like their cats. Maybe cat, <laughs> cats are smaller, I don't, I don't know, T statistically. Um, but you know, that's not that exciting, but it is sort of interesting where we could get going with that if we needed to, or you know, horses is another market where, but we'd like to get into to people um, more quickly and think that that's sort of a distraction. We should probably go directly to people and pick pick some and so right now we're talking to a lot of different um, groups to try to discern that with a, a logical structure for how to make that decision and so we're hiring people to help us make that decision so we can um, make it clear-eyed and pick the best go-to-market strategy we can. There's that question in the back of the room here. Hi. Hi. Um, I, I, maybe I missed it. What was the, the, the sampling window that you ended up with to be able to get a clean picture? And if it's too short to be practical because uh, of the, the blood movement and so forth, can you use digital techniques to stabilize it or some sort of corrective optics like they do with telescopes? Yeah, I mean, it really comes, the good point, the way they did it, like um, uh, that imaging is 70 years old with uh, the mirrors that just detect it, but you still have the scattering that you don't know. So the speckled, we have 50 to 100 microseconds, but a lot of the work that I showed you was with continuous wave lasers where we slowed time to zero using either dead things, which, still have Brownian motion, but they, they, you know, and we do slow scans because um, we like to have a lot of power in a single pulse rather than it spread out over time. So we pulse and get a lot of power, make our exposure in a microsecond. So um, some of our scans are pretty slow because we're 
the, the limiting thing was we had our ultrasonic fixed focus probe on an XYZ stage that was motorized. We upgraded that to a robot recently in one setup, but really the fast scanning is done with a phased array beam steering. Um, the camera chip has an output problem if you use existing output without the double chip, so their earlier systems could only go at like 16 frames, to 16 voxels a second, and so we were using existing off-the-shelf technology with time equals zero, figuring out what we could do with signal to noise ratio as we've been able to figure out how to speed these things up and, and where the sort of limits are. So the laser being continuous wave really, um, you don't know what the scattering is through this many layers, a scattering event every hundred microns. And it's, and it's moving. And so ultimately, it's a dream. We'd love to learn how the, the, the molecules are moving so that we can have a map and predict. You know, it's almost like I, I have worked with these great technicians who solder unbelievably precise. And um, they're usually women, it's small, and um, they're young, um, with really good eyes, sorry, it's true. And you just watch how they breathe and drop the solder at the right point. And so can we do that with the vibrations of the layers of things and work up a model for it is a question. But right now, I mean, you could just make a pulse laser with good coherence, which is what we've done. And so we don't actually have to, it's a sort of simpler thing to do as you scan but I'd like to, it'd be great. Okay, we'll take uh, one last question and I think you'll still have a chance to interact with her afterwards, so let me just take the last. Hi. Um, Hi. Ap apart from the presentation that you gave today, uh, do you have any advice? Would you give any advice for uh, graduate students just sitting here? <laughs> As to string choosing a research topic or? Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. it's so interesting. I got, I was talking to, um, people today here, sorry, I'll, I'll leave my blood alone, I just didn't want it to spill, um, you know, of what you decide to do and why, and it's just, I just want to be in love with the stuff that I'm doing, and like, you don't always get to do that, like, I, I mentioned I had a brain tumor when I was in graduate school, after that, I finished my PhD in six months, and um, started my first company that was doing liquid crystal and silicon devices, mostly because I needed health insurance, because I was an American, it was pre-Obamacare, I know we're headed to a post, maybe, world. But, you know, like, you get to these things, like life happens, and the setbacks that you have, and you have to deal with them. Maybe, maybe you have to take a boring job for a while. Maybe, hopefully not, you have to do a boring PhD thesis, hopefully not. Um, <laughs> you could switch advisor, no, I shouldn't say that, but, um, you know, like, how do you let yourself go for it? You're all in this room, like you're all like off the charts brilliant. Like if you can just combine that with something you fall in love with, you're gonna be unstoppable. You're gonna do amazing things because you're gonna put in the hours because you love the work or the impact that it can have. And there will be setbacks. There will be times you have to do boring, like, I don't know, like, I quit a job when, like, like you know, I start only, like, 30% of the stuff I'm doing. I like to stay at, like, 70 to 80%, but there's always this portion of stuff that you have to do that you don't like. I mean, right now I'm reading, con I need a CEO. I, we're hiring, by the way. I need a COO, so I don't have to read the contract for the 12th time where I really don't want to compare, like, did they sneak in a word and change not to the, you know, like, it's just, a, I don't, that doesn't get me going, but, you know, you do it until you have some. But, like, how do you put yourself, because most people, I mean, I think everybody struggles to get their PhD. Like even whatever, Richard Feynman struggled to get his PhD. And everybody, they, they make it hard on purpose. I don't know, maybe the professors can talk about that strategy. <laughs> but it's hard, right? But like, it's not because they don't think you're, you're, maybe that's part of the, 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 the process. But yeah, I mean, how do you get your, how, I was just reading this study by the National Bureau of Economic Research about happiness. And apparently, statistically, if you're on the edge of whether you should do something or not and flip a coin, and they did this with several people, you shouldn't propose. You're going to be unhappy. Although the error bars on it are large. But if you quit your job, actually pretty, everybody's pretty happy statistically. <laughs> <laughs> or dye your hair, or move. Those are the three things that everybody's always happy when they do, <laughs> which is really surprising to me. But like, if you're, because you can do anything. I mean, if you let yourself. But I, I, 
I don't know. My, my, I've moved around a bunch. My career's had many um, setbacks. Sometimes you have a boss that's sort of difficult. You know, there's a lot of issues that can happen. Or, you know, sharp elbows. I remember the sharp elbows. Of, it always mattered. Like, there never seemed to be enough credit to go around when I was in grad school. And these are still problems, yes. <laughs> so, you know. But you get to be here with all these cool people. So, you know, and and... I don't know if that's helpful or not, <laughs> actually. All right. Well, I, I think this has been really inspirational. Thanks for the great Thank demos. You. I can only imagine what your Amazon suggestion list is. Would you like to buy more blood? Like, I'm just imagining. Thank you for yeah. the demos. Thank you for inspiring us. Um, thank let's you uh, thank me. Dr. Mary Lou Jepson one more time. And I think she'll be around if you want to interact a little bit, and then we'll have to steal her away. But please come up. I'm sure she's happy to talk to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just going to put the meat away.